practical session. I hope you guys can hear me. Um, yeah, and I want to start by thanking Christy and all the local organizers, Tian and Anu. Um, this is the first time I'm attending a Pulsar workshop in South Africa. Um, so it's very exciting and I really appreciate the hard work you guys have done. It's possible um, and to bring our visitors here and all of that. Um, yeah, it's really fun. Um, my task today is to tell you guys a bit about the theory you need as you go into the practicals. Um, you'll probably recognize some of the things that have been introduced by other speakers already. So here and there a reminder will be helpful. And then at any point please feel free to interrupt me, ask questions. Um, I'll also try and keep an eye on the time um, so that we can end with sort of instructions for what we do. Just know that these 
are all just representing a single, uh, single rotation of the pulsar. Okay, so now our task is, as you saw in that ruler, is we have to determine what is the time of arrival of this pulsar telescope. Um, and in order to do so, we need to have a method to say this is when it arrived. And the way we do this is through um, a process of tempered matching. So I think people already showed you yesterday that um, single pulses can be quite weak, but if you add many of them together, you can get a very high signal to noise ratio pulse profile. So what you'll do in your tutorials is you'll learn how to make um, a very high signal to noise template either by just adding a lot of data or by making some analytical mathematical fit to the shape you have. And that will then be the template that you use to pass across your data. And the moment your template and your data match, you say that's when that pulse arrived. So basically, you know, if it's a perfect Gaussian and you can model it with a single Gaussian, you can just always say, well, I'm going to say when that peak strikes my telescope, that's when it arrived. But since we've seen pulses in all sorts of shapes, the idea is that you have a template and you match it and you say the moment it's had to move this amount in either phase or time in seconds, that is, um, with respect to some reference phrase, that is when the pulse of life. Um, and up here, um, you don't have to care about this too deeply today, but I'm just showing you how simple it actually is to know the phase evolution of your pulse profile. So, um, if anybody wants these slides afterwards, um, we'll upload the PDFs and stuff. I see people take them down, so um, uh, those are just um, but if, you, if, we, if we're okay in calling this axis phase, and I'm sorry, uh, we want to know what is the phase in time, then all we need to know is the pulse period that I've plotted here as spin frequency. So either we can talk about the frequency, it takes at what uh, rate is the pulse are spinning as a frequency, or we can talk about the period, how many seconds did it take to go around the time axis. So in this equation, I'm using frequency and frequency derivative instead of period and period um, as you can tell, they're, they're quite interchangeable. And so you can see this 2 pi is just saying that um, I have to count 2 pi's, a single extra rotation, and if I just know what the pulse period is, then I can know when the next one arrives. And the fact that, that the equation doesn't end here is because, as I said to you before, the pulsar is also slowing down. So you have to expand to know the full phase evolution. You actually have to know how the pulse period is changing, and maybe for some pulses even higher order. Okay. Um, so this would be the ideal easy situation if the Earth telescope was completely stable, right? Then you could say we have a method to determine when the pulse arrived. But we know this is not true. We live in the solar system, and and the Earth is being tugged on by all these other planets and most prominently by the presence of the sun. So the Earth itself is, is not a stationary reference frame and we're orbiting, orbiting around the sun. So um, what we actually have to do is we have to come up with the time that the pulse arrived at our telescope and then we have to transform this to the solar system barrier center. And so the solar system barrier center is just the center of mass of the solar system. So in this little animation it goes, um, see? Yeah, you can see, so this, for example, that you have the sun and the earth orbiting, then um, this stable point is the very center. And so we want to pretend as if all the pulse arrival times arrive there, because that's not a new point. And so to do that, you need to, do, you need to take into account all these delays, mostly dominated by the sun. So for example, because the sun is there, we know there's a gravitational redshift or a time dilation. You guys have probably learned this idea that if, if something moves through curves of space time, time moves slower. And so the fact that as we're observing, um, signals are passing close by the sun means that there's, there's an additional delay. So that's what I put up here as, a, as an E, um, a delay that we have to account for. And then we also know that um, because of these actual deformations, because um, if objects are gravitationally dense and have a strong gravitational field, they actually impact um, the space time and compress it. And because of this deformation of the space time, you also have propagation through this curve of space time. That's an additional travel time. So I'm just putting up these expressions so that you understand um, for us to transform the time of arrival at the telescope to the solar system barrier center, we also have to um, make sure that we account for all these additional. 
And the way we do this um, is through models that are um, provided to us by the JPL um, um, laboratory. And so you'll see later on when we show you some of your parameter files for the timing system, that in there there will be something called like a DE436 or some model that we take from JPL and that describes the solar system at any given time. And I've just put up this plot to show you that even the very center of our solar system is in stationary with time. Right here you can see it's plotted uh, as it moves around the current year. In 2021, it was very much um, at the center of the sun, but you can see most of the very center lies outside of the center of the sun. Um, so you won't have to do the, the timing reference corrections yourself, but there will be things within the software that, that helps with these corrections. Um, okay, so if we then go back to this idea of um, uh, trying to find the best timing model that describes when the pulse arrives, let's assume those reference corrections were dealt with exactly fine, but I still see this change. Um, this pulse arrived significantly later to what my model expected. Then, what I would do is I would plot over time when, when did I expect the pulse to arrive and when did it arrive. And you can see in this situation, the difference between the model and the data is getting larger, so it's getting worse. My issue was here at the beginning was kind of okay, but now it's getting increasingly worse. And depending on the shape that you see in these residuals, you can kind of infer what parameter is causing the problems. And this, this one here is an example of if you have the, um, the pulse period of derivative problem. So remember we said that pulses over time has been slower. So if you if your estimate going into this timing model had the wrong P dot, then you'd see this in your residuals, and then you can, of course, this is the beauty of data models, then you can update your model and you can, um, you can come up with a better parameter value for P dot. Okay, so once you, if you do that and you have a better parameter for PDOT, then all of a sudden you'll see one residuals, which um, many people also showed yesterday. And basically now we're hoping that on this Y scale we'll be down to some microsecond decision um, per data point. So here I just have a summary of sort of the, the standard single pulse star problems you can have if you see these um, heavy sinus points in the residuals. And you can see that they're annular, then it's probably that you have the possible position wrong. So the pulses themselves also, also um, move and what you, um, sorry, like that, this is just the RA deck is wrong. And so what you see in the sinus points are coming from the fact that the Earth is orbiting around the Sun. And um, if these sinus points are growing with time, well then it probably means that you've got the point of motion wrong. So you can think of it like the pulsar has some movement in the sky, right? So if you get it, if you have a proper motion um, wrong, then it's like getting the position and increasing the wrong with time. So you have a, um, a sinus one that just gets worse. Um, we've already spoken about the period of the Okay, so that was it for, for isolated pulsars. Um, now we know that this process can become quite a bit more complicated if actually the pulsar is in a binary. Um, so there was a lot of talk yesterday about binary, so you'll have a neutron star, um, probably a, a millisecond pulsar that's been spun up by its companion, and this whole evolutionary process has come to an end, so you just have to wipe off the companion and the millisecond pulsar and they're all in one another. But the fact that there's a binary here has a direct consequence on when you actually arrive, um, when you actually detect pulses at your telescope. Because you can imagine if the pulsar is at this state, Binary the way I've got it here, then it's a longer travel time to the telescope. Whereas if the binary keeps on moving and the pulsar is on this side now, it's a shorter travel time. So there's all sorts of binary effects that you now have to take into account. Um, the, the other way of thinking about this is that because you can account for these binary parameters, you actually get to learn a lot of interesting um, physics about the system. So just by doing pulsar timing and updating your models, you, need, you get to figure out how eccentric, for example, is it, is it very circular or is it very elongated. You, you, if you're lucky, you get to figure out things like the intonation of the orbit, and we'll look at those um, effects in a bit more detail. So, um, I think Matthew already mentioned the Kepler um, equation for a binary orbit, so maybe you guys remember that this is kind of uh, the basic parameters you need to describe um, a binary system. So there's some orbital period, you see typically they're in D, 
days. If they're really relativistic, like the double neutron star, then this goes down to uh, a couple of hours. Um, and the other things are the size, like the projected semi major axis of the orbit, often measured with really, really light signals, how the same thing I've already mentioned, and then these two parameters describe the free astron, right? When, when can we reach free astron um, in time, and at what longitude of the, of the orbital line we are with free astron. So just by observing, um, just by timing this neutron star in this binary, and by looking at the patterns that come out in your residual plots, you can, you can actually figure out um, what, what these parameters are. Um, and beyond that, and these are kind of some of the exciting ones, you, if you have all your covariant parameters fixed, you can also measure some post covariant parameters. And the reason I think they're exciting is because this is where you're really um, probing the strong field regime or the relativistic nature of this binary. So these are very compact objects of one another. And so it means cool things like the space time around these two stars, um, around the neutron star and the white ball, is very warped. And so one of the um, interesting uh, effects you can quickly see uh, if, if you've got a favorite, a favorable inclination is this idea that the pulsar emission would have to travel through the um, curved space time of its companion on its way to the telescope. The telescope is here. And so in this configuration, it'll take that pulse signal longer to reach you than, say, the moment when the orbit has moved on and, and, and the companion is no longer directly in your way along the line of sight. Um, so here I put up um, the post covariant parameters, the one I've just described as the Shapiro delay. It's the one that um, there's extra travel time due to the presence of the <coughs> mass. And then also yesterday it was already mentioned things like the adaptive periastron. So um, the way we see Mercury's orbit um, <coughs> process um, in, in the sky, we get this so much more extreme in the university binaries. And I'll come to, to the orbital decay, um, so, so let me skip on, since I've got more slides on these things. But the, um, the, the so semi surprising thing about this is that if you assume general relativity, then the expressions for each of these post covariant parameters is pretty straightforward. This was already worked out um, in the late 80s, and you can see, for example, this here is the, um, the very advanced pre astron, right? If you know what the mass of the pulse are, the mass of the companion is, all these other parameters, like the orbital period, the centricity, they are just standard covariant parameters that you by now would have easily picked off from your timing. So if you are able to actually measure the effect of the um, precession, for example, in just by studying your time residuals, and if you are able to measure, for example, the Shapiro delay that they're talking about, this extra travel time, um, then you've got equations that help you solve for the mass of the pulse and the mass of the So it's quite, these are quite powerful um, equations in the sense that you just have to, uh, for a favorable uh, binary orbit, if you can see these patterns emerge or the signatures of these parameters in your residuals, then you get to infer things like the mass of the pulse and the And the other cool thing is these, the, the set of equations for this depends on the gravity theory you've picked. So here this is set up for um, general relativity, and so you can see this becomes quickly overdetermined. For example, if you measure omega dot and two of the other post parameters, then from, from those equations you get multiple solutions for the mass and for the, uh, for the mass of the tangent, you see, and the mass of the pulsar. And all of those masses have to be the same if your theory is, if, if your system is well described by the general uh, by the <coughs> theory you pick. So I'll show you a bit later um, uh, exactly how that works out as, a, as ways to do tests in general. Okay, so this is a famous system, I'm sure you guys have all heard of the whole um, Taylor binary. The, um, this is, here I want to talk to you about all the um, decay, which is why I skipped it earlier. And what's interesting about the system is this was the first binary um, pulsar system discovered. So before this, all the pulsars that were going were single pulsars. And then this one was discovered and they noticed that there was a um, a sinusoid in the residuals, and this had sin the, the sinusoidal pattern um, had what's the orbital period had a signature of about eight hours, and so they figured out that there's some bubble in the system that's coming from the fact that it has a companion. And what's really remarkable is that this companion was also a neutron star. It's not one that we can observe.
observer, but it's also a super compact object, right? So the very first binary system that was discovered happened to be a very extreme one. There aren't many known such systems today. It's got a tight orbit of 7.8 um, hours, and the, the pulsar that we do observe is the 60 millisecond pulsar. So it's playing quite rapidly, and, and for which we can do um, high precision timing. And here, for example, the orbital precession is effectively low from Mercury, which I think Matthew described yesterday as well as about 43 arc seconds per century. Here it's moving super fast. It's moving, it's changing its orbital orientation in the sky at 4.2 degrees per year. Um, and what was, what was the most prominent science coming out of studying the system was the fact that, um, do you remember in my post parameters parameters there was one called, what let me show you, there was this one called P, B dot. So it's the derivative of the orbital of the binary orbital period. So how is the size of the orbit that we just said is 7.8 hours, how is that changing with time? And what they noticed with the system, so obviously this is um, work done um, afterwards, because this now has data all the way up to 2005, but they could see how the orbit was shrinking with, um, with, uh, as they continued timing the pulsar over years. So just by studying when the pulse signal is arriving from just one millisecond pulsar and seeing the effect of that, they could figure out that this orbit was shrinking um, at 3.5 meters per year. And um, these data points, these dots, come from observational measurements. And then the solid line here is the prediction for my general relativity. So um, I'm sure many of you might have seen this before. People always made the point to emphasize that nobody fit this curve to this data. It's a comparison between this is what the data tells me, and this is actually what I get if I compute by general relativity and using the particular parameters, what is my expected change in the okay. And so um, the reason this result is very prominent is the, the why the binary uh, orbit is actually shrinking is because the system is losing energy in the form of gravitational waves. Um, and at that point, we already knew that this was predicted by Einstein's equations, but it was had been observed. And so this was the first indirect detection of gravitational waves, and they uh, were awarded the you Nobel know, Prize for this work. Um, okay, so here I just have a Mercury's 43 uh, arc seconds per century. These days, there's an even more extreme system. So you notice that one um, had a binary period of 7.8 hours. This one that I'm showing you now is the double pulse system that Matt also had up yesterday. Um, it's got a orbital period of about 2 point something hours, so even tighter. And I want to use this um, system to explain another one of the post period effects to you. And that's the one, the Shapiro delay that we discussed, where if the orbit um, so we talk about um, orbits being edge on if they orbit like this and I am the telescope and they're face on if they're orbiting the way clock, clock handles or which call them hands, hands thank you, clock hands will do, right? So this effect would only happen when we prominently observe if the system is edge on because the pulsar at some point has to be behind its companion so that it will experience this delay on its way to me. If it's face on and they're just going around each other in the sky like this, it's never directly passing past its, um, its mass of So if your inclination is favorable, then in, in, and, and you pretend that you, or let's say you forgot to include the fact that the companion has a mass, then the moment the pulsar passes behind this companion, you'll see this excessive delay in your residuals before it comes down um, closer to zero. And so remember what I'm plotting here is the difference between when did, I, when did my model tell me the pulse would arrive and when is my data showing me the pulse would arrive. And my model for the pulse should have already been here. Um, this is a perfect model which is that the difference between the model and data is zero. But actually my model is so bad that the pulse is arriving 100 microseconds later. And that's because I forgot to include a parameter in my data that describes the mass of this companion, which actually describes the space time date um, that the pulse signal has to travel through. So the good news is if you do see the signal, it means you can instantly uh, measure so the R and the S are the two parameters that describe the shape. And from that, you can instantly infer the companion mass and the sign I, which gives you the information I here is the orbital. 
So you're getting a, a vast amount of detailed information on a very distant binary um, object in the sky just because you can see the pulses from the neutron star. Okay, so, and to show you just how um, exceptionally fantastic this system is, um, for this one, the, we can measure all the post-primary parameters. We see the um, omega dot, the precession in the sky, is 17 degrees per year, so even faster than the last data I showed you. Um, and what I'm, what I'm plotting here is um, a mass-mass diagram. So remember that all of these equations relate the pulsar mass and the companion mass. And so one way to show that this gravity theory, and here this is a GR description, one way to show that general relativity actually describes the system very well is to say, if I observe omega dot, then it can imply any of these pairs of pulsar masses or companion masses, right? So if omega dot has got um, has one particular constant value, then it can either be made up of um, which one's which? This is a pulsar B that has a mass of two um, solar masses, and then if that's true, then the mass for pulsar A is set. Right? So any one of these pairs would work. But the moment you've got more than one of these observed, they intersect. And so then that becomes the only singular solution that tells you what is the mass of the um, pulsar A and what is the mass of pulsar B. And so you can see that every single line here describing one of these effects is intersecting at exactly one single point. And so it's telling you that the theory of gravity you're, you're um, using to describe how these parameters evolve um, is, is consistent and um, intersects nicely in the mass of time. <coughs> so there's a, a brilliant paper on the system out um, well, it's two years by now, though, and you'll see in there that you can get to measure higher order um, corrections than just these are sort of the first order post mechanical expansions. By now, you can even do um, uh, more, more crazy instrument tests than you are. Okay. Uh, they just pulls on. Right. So this work I put up to show that you know not, not all systems are this extreme outlines. When you have a dark neutron star, you get all these perfect tests. Um, many of them are um, harder and you won't really figure out what you figured out after you've studied them. So I'll try and make this quick. This is a pulsar when you look at the near at 95. It's in a very eccentric orbit. And so if you remember from the equations, well, we'll get to it. Moment, it's very eccentric, your chances of seeing precession um, is quite high. So, here you can see we've got some near head data for it in the later years, but many of these parameters that go into describing the timing model have got long time signatures, right? So, we look at all these orbital, uh, all these annual um, changes and, and, and effects. So, oftentimes, even now, if you've got near head data, it's um, useful to include historic data so that you can see long term trends in your situation. Um, and you can see from the fact that these um, the, the, the two are centered on the zero line means that we fit for all the parameters in our model already, and we've got the Kepler parameters out. We know it's a 24.6 day period, we know the size, we know when, when it reaches Priastron. It's um zero it's eccentricity is 0 0.1. It's, eccentricity is always measured between zero and one, right? Zero being a perfect circle and one being a line. Um, and in terms of um, stellar and binary evolution, this is highly eccentric. Most eccentricities we measure is sort of 10 to the minus 6 or something like this. So this is quite, um, quite a, a eccentric system. And if you look at this one, um, you can just about make out the Shapiro delay. So nothing as dramatic as what we see in the, in the double pulsar system. But it's still good enough for us to be able to get out the mass um, of the system. So we find that the pulsar is reasonably heavy, it's 1.7 times the mass of the sun. Um, and here I just wanted to point out that because it's an eccentric system, you can see if this number is large, then this below the um, fraction goes smaller, and so omega bulk goes up. And so that's why we get to measure um, omega bulk quite well in the system. Um, and part of why I showed this is because I want to uh, introduce to you another sort of application of this type of work. So um, my talk is um, pulsar certified waves or whatever, because there's so much science you can do. If you're keen on gravitational waves, you've already seen where that, how that comes into play. If you want to do gravity tests, you've already seen how that comes into play. Here, we're looking at the nuclear physics side of things. And 
and that's at the moment we've got um, a mass measure by neutron star. We're still trying to understand what the interior of neutron star is made up of, right? People, um, have to explain the evolution and we think you know it's mainly neutrons, but what exactly is in the in the core of neutron star? Is it um, you know what kind of superfluid, what particles are present? And what I put up here is all the theoretical models that people come up that describe this um, so-called equation of state. So the equation of state for neutron star relates um, density and pressure. So basically, you you want to uh, state it differently. You want to understand for a given radius of a neutron star, what mass would have been found, for example. Um, and so, depending on what particles you put in, so all of these have got the collections of protons and neutrons in there, and, and then you have to model the strong interaction between the particles, etc. And depending on how you do that, you'll come up with these different um, theoretical curves that tell you for a given radius um, and mass pair what that theory is. It's really hard to measure radii. I think Matthew also mentioned this, and we can talk about that maybe in some more detail. But now you see that it's pretty easy if you do a lot of time to get great mass estimates. So every time we measure a radial mass of neutron star, we can try to draw out uh, a theory, and then the theorists can go back and try and create a new theory. Um, so for example, this is the plot I just showed you, and I'm going to find any theory is that it's not able to at least reach that mass in the long value. So here we've lost a bunch of ones that were strange core models. Um, and this is the heaviest neutron star we know at present. And so you can see in this particular graph, of course it depends on which models you include, we started out with about 26 theoretical models and then we ended with, with only a couple. So if nuclear physics is something we're keen on, then this is a nice, um, a nice uh, interface as well. And so I think the last, um, the last pulsar application I want to put up has been mentioned uh, extensively by Ryan yesterday, and this is also where we're going to drive with this workshop. It's talking about can we see evidences for um, gravitational waves in pulsar time arrays. So now we're doing something altogether different again, right? Now we're not studying a single system and figuring out its, its detailed properties. Now we're studying a grid of pulsars and asking, are they all, um, as an ensemble of pulsars, are they all experiencing some sort of gravitational wave? Or rather, as I'm on the Earth and I'm bobbing on this gravitational wave background, uh, can I tell that I'm bobbing because all the pulsars I'm observing seem to have um, slowed down from my range, right? So there was this big news flash June this year where all the different PDAs produced evidences for um, gravitational waves. Um, so this has already been mentioned, I just want to put it up here. And if you will allow me, I'm playing my favorite rap on this. Um, oh, let us know. Oh, um, I think it's my favorite rap. Um, maybe just go out. I think it's my favorite mic. I think I think it's my And Chris, did you know we're um, connected to speakers? It's Time of arrival, 
unreliable to the service is comparisonly, your software is going to do that in the background. And then I try to um, just explain to you that there's all these other sort of cool fundamental physics that you can do. Um, because um, um, fossil timing gives you access to param parameters with such precision, you can actually start constraining other fields of, of um, fundamental physics. So that's the interlude to here. So I want to pause, maybe we can do a line and switch on the lines and spectrum on. Um, because after this, I'll, I'll, I'll start using a couple of commands and, and software things. Um, so are there any questions? Um, I've got one. Uh, just about the, the time of arrival. Um, when you have those weird uh, profiles, uh, is it always thinking from the peak of the, the, the amplitude peak? Uh, is it is time of arrival just one number? So, yeah, so the time of arrival is going to be one value, it's going to be given as an NJD, so a high decimal NJD, so I can just go to someone like this. Uh, I'll give you an example, like here. So this is what your time of arrival will look like. So it's it's a day, that's what the, um, this uh, 5623 is, right? And then this is a fraction of a day. And the reason you have to keep all the decimals, right, is one microsecond is about 1.1 1 .1 to the minus 11. So it only has a single timestamp to answer your question in that way. But what that timestamp is, is the full um, template correlation. So you, you give the software your templates and the data, and, and some when you say at some start with some reference time and some reference space. And then after that, you won't search the peak, it will find when does the data particularly match the best. Yeah, yeah. Something, something. Yeah, there yeah, yeah, is a follow-up on that, that when you make the templates, you have a choice about where do you work, what you call zero. And uh, depending on what your scientific interests are, that, that, that will depend. And like for gravitational wave timing, you don't really care. But like, for example, if you wanted to say, where does the, uh, like, lots of pulsars show both gamma rays and radio waves? And if, if you want to know uh, if the gamma rays are coming from the same part of the rotation as, as the radio waves, you want to track things. So, yeah, but typically people will align, you know, align so the peaks at zero or something else. There'll be some sign. Yeah, but yeah, typically, you have to track that. And, you know, when we do, when we do look, look for gamma ray pulsations, we have to do. Yeah. And so you'll remember when I last spoke, we were talking about, um, you know, what we really want to do is we want to have data and some kind of template, and so we're going to cross correlate these and we'll come up with these things more time arrivals. And these time arrivals will represent to us when the offer arrived in our telescope, we'll transform that to some various and then that will finally be our tools to fix some of these interesting physical parameters. So uh, we'll have a model telling us when to expect the whole signal at the Paris Center, and then we'll compare it to what our data is. Um, and so you now know how to make pulse profiles, so we can kind of go to the next step. And before we do that, I just wanted to make um, another statement which kind of already came through, but I want to emphasize it. And that's that if we do pulse our timing, and I'm talking about a model that predicts when the pulse is going to arrive. My model is good when I can comfortably account for every single rotation of the pulse. And so that might not instantly sound so special, but it can sometimes be very hard to know if the pulse are in my next thing you observe now, and you, you don't observe it, it's a month later, it, it's hard to know exactly how many rotations passed in that time. And, and so we talk about a good time model that represents us with face connected solutions if we're not unsure about even a single rotation in all those months' time. So, um, what I put up here as an example, and um, um, so this data is not here, um, is the following. We started so the Near Time Project, which is um, the research project that um, Swinburne, uh, folks visiting are also a member of. Um, they started observing pulsars using Meerkat in 2019. So, one of the favorite really bright um, basic pulsars was called 0437. This is its profile. You can, from a template um, correlation perspective, see that it's going to produce nice TOAs at a very sharp peak. Um, and 
then it's got it's also fast money and um, it's on star, so the cost period is 4.8 milliseconds. So if we, if we say we observe this pulsar from noon exact on that day, then until 3 o'clock and it's not today, I think my next slide will put it away. Yeah, sorry, I didn't update this one today. If from noon on the 26th of March 2019 until 3 o'clock on January, it was like when I lost stage of the storm. Um, you count every rotation that the pulsar has made, taking into account the fact that, for example, it's slowing down from these moments, right? So it's, um, it's almost four years ago. Then we can tell you exactly that it's made, whatever this number is, amount of rotation. And it's fascinating me, I'm not unsure at all. There's not a plus minus one making this one. We have to count for every single rotation. Um, and it's kind of the power of knowing they are 20 billion rotations exactly this period that, um, that allows us to determine other levels of mining parameters really, really accurately. So, um, we know we have a list of single beats, and in other words, if I put up the rest of the timing model for you guys here, well, I guess one of the first parameters I would already have up is the pulse period. So, when I was speaking um, informally, I said it has a pulse period of 5.8 milliseconds. But what I should have said is that it has a pulse period of 5.757.1192, etc. milliseconds, and all of these are significant digits. And so the only reason we're able to do such precise measurements is because we have come up with solutions where the pulse of the model is space connected. Um, and the little funny trick here is to say, looks like I've got my error bar, that's the plus or minus of the to the minus or whatever two. Um, and once we're in this regime where we can actually extract um, timing parameters and the system parameters of this binary to such high precision, it's kind of mind boggling what you can get out. So for this particular pulsar, we've got a very accurate estimate of its distance as well. So it's um, uh, at 127.6 parsecs. And the reason I highlight that is because it's cool for me to say that at this really far distance away, at like 4 Kilometers, I can actually tell you the size of the orbit to within 30 meters because this here, the semi-major um, semi project axis, is a, is a proxy for kind of the size of the spine. And so at this mind-bogglingly far distance, I'm, I'm able to say things to many meters. This, this never happens in astronomy. So um, the fact that after many years you keep on tiling the pulsar and you improve all these parameters, you end up in these bizarre situations where you can you make incredibly um, it comes with effort and mainly with waiting. So here I've kind of put up the, um, the table of how pulsar um, time parameters are obtained. It's very rough, it really depends on, on the system. But let's say the way Tian described us, let's say you discover a pulsar, then um, especially with the telescope like um, Neocat, you'll have reasonably accurate position or cheating in the orient depth of the pulsar in the sky. You will have um, a good estimate of the dispersion rate instantly because especially with instruments like Neocat, it has a, um, a broad bandwidth and so the dispersion measure is really how the pulse signal sweeps across the frequency. So it doesn't change, well it does change the time, but I mean you already have get an accurate dispersion rate estimate when you You will have an estimate of the pulse period because that's what allowed you to discover it the way that TL was explaining to us or if you were doing it and then what typically happens um, after discovery is you'll have something you should follow up. So let's say some weeks after discovery, if the pulsar is in a binary, you might start seeing um, sinusoidal effects in your um, timing residuals that tell you that there's some modulation that this pulsar is actually And so you could get up, um, uh, you could get the orbital periods up to some, some not a very precise estimate, but some And so, um, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but you can see it takes months of regular observing to obtain other um, binary parameters, like some of the Kepler parameters we can have here. And it can take more than a year to actually nail down many of these um, post comparing parameters. I will have the telescope on the other one, 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 the
a lot of us uh, started into benefits from multi-year campaigns. And that's, that's what you also really get a feel for when you talk about the fossil time and gray work, uh, the work that you're looking for our national ways, is that the reason we're now at this point where people like Brian and all others can, um, can write papers saying there's increased evidence for professional ways is because these data sets span decades or at least they get in bit. And so finally, you know, you get to these um, so now we're doing the step-by-step timing, and um, you've already been well introduced to Peers Archive. So um, Peers Archive is the tool that we're just interrogating data with and, and that you use to make plots, so you can use something like this on Snap to get the SMR of you correct it for dispersion using PAN minus D or other sort of um, um, integrations of the data that you can do with PAN. You, you, so this is kind of the pre-process. The bit that you haven't done yet is the bit where you, after you think your data looks good, you need to make some templates so that we can do that cross-correlation. So that's the bit that we'll do. That includes using something like this on add, and then you'll repeat the time of when I was using ads. And then once you've wrapped up this process, you have your MVP time of arrival, so we can go to another software called Tempo 2, which is what Ryan's project and so just to emphasize that this has really been made clear now from your, from your first interactions because you see all these scrunch commands across the different dimensions of your data but if you're looking at an archive file which can manage your lots of data there will always be a number of frequency channels associated with that a number of time what we call sub-integrations you see in the sub -int, and then polarizations um, the four search parameters and, and the most of the time we really do care about this care about uh, well, these scrunch are what we just care about when we go the So this is um, step one of doing pulsar timing is that you need to create the template. And the template has to represent the pulsar, uh, like the ideal pulsar. So um, for the ideal robot uh, shape for this pulsar. So one way to achieve this is just to say, well, I'm going to take all the data that I have for a particular pulsar. So that star of AR um, now represents all the files that you've created for this particular pulsar that you've observed, and I'm just going to add them together and I'm going to output them as something that you call something not intended. Um, don't, I, um, but Ryan and I haven't spoken in detail, I'm just explaining the commands, but I'm sure you can have its own exact files and exact um, extensions. So you can just now um, click on your case and you just talk about what's the principles. So you add all the data and you create some templates, okay? And because you've added all the data, that will be a very high signal to noise um, template. And then you would, for example, if you were going to use some kind of new timing, you would actually want to time, let's say your data had eight frequency channels, you might want to time every frequency channel with its own template representing that frequency channel. Because it, it could be such that the profile the shape changes by a lot of frequency. And today I think we'll just use a single um, template for all frequencies, but that's why I have a um, eight frequency um, Okay, so here this uh, this plan command was just to turn it into eight frequencies, so that's why I get scrunched by by large factor. So the take home message for you here is that basically you add you add the data, all of the data that you added here, I'm just keeping eight frequency channels, you can have a single one with the um, and this is now your sort of base profile, but you can see there's still some, some noise structure. And so then you do our very best to make that into a noiseless analytic um, template that you can use for the time. And for that, there are various ways that you can do it. One of the examples is that we can make it smoother, so you can see that there's a um, subconsciously involved with it to smooth the, the template shape or some way that you can do so. So there's options and once you run that on your data you get an analytic noise free template. Um, and this we've had up before, but it's just worth quickly looking at again. Um, so here's our ad and here's our smooth of which is what's going to get in your analytic template. And then the pass command is what's going to take the template and take the data and the data's timestamp, right? And it's going to do the cross correlation for you and compute those time of arrivals that we were talking about. Um, so that's how it works. You you practice the command, you pass it, this was S N this was my extension because I made an eight channel smooth template. You will take a pattern 
the possible and deliver template that I have seen produced. And I do run that on all the data and you find time to add all the data. So once you do that, you have to write that out into the so called timing file. So you can see here I'm still using the same command. I'm saying use my template, use my data, and then you write the output into some file that we can be available at long term. And I'll basically end just by showing you what are the ingredients of this timing file. So the way these timing files are always set up is that first you'll have the archive file name. I just wrote AR and it tells it to put into my slide. Here you'll have the full log um, data um, for which this um, TOA was completed. So you'll have the data file name here. Here you will have, have the frequency channel associated with that data. So you can see. I um, channelize my data to always have eight frequency channels, but we're moving over eight frequencies. So we go 941, 411, 12, 13, 14, 15, 6, and then we start again. So I've cut out lots of these models to show that it doesn't very often. It's basically these groupings of eight, um, um, eight frequencies before we move again. And for each of those frequency channels, you'll have this as the TOA. So this is the exact NJD with the super high precision of when we think the template and the data best match one another, and this is the error on that. And I'm sure Ryan is going to tell you that this here is in days, so this is fractional days, but the tier A error is in um, five seconds. Um, okay, and so here the rest of these others are this is just plans. So this tells you um, it's often Useful when you start using tempo two in one of the current things, um, depending on, on, for example, what what um, uh, black labels you use or what particular band you're associated with. So um, you can ignore most of these facts just depending on what binary is stored in other flag. But it's, it's basically a way for you to keep track of where this UA came from. And you can see some of them are quite useful. For example, here you can have a template. Flags, they will tell you what technique you use, so you can see how this is the time that they have the same So I'll end there. Once you have the, the term file, the next thing you'll do is you run this new software. So now we're outside of the file file, now we're going to do that too. And put its graphic plugin, and so that's just the bit that, that brings up the plots. And essentially, you pass it your basic learning model. So this par file. It has a value for each of the timing model parameters. Um, so your best estimate at this point before you have new data. So it will contain, for example, the name of the fossil, the position in the sky, the fossil period, all these things that you um, fine-tune until this observation, and then you'll pass up in the term file containing your new data and you can find update um, parameters. So this was a particular case where uh, in this part file <coughs> And once you get fit for Omega dot, um, you can write the residuals and you can also have a value for Omega dot. So I'll end there. I'm going to sneak in something quick that's super unrelated. Um, but just bear with me, then I don't have to come up here again. Um, you will see many faces on this slide. You recognize there's John Ridley, there's Anna, there's Christian, Tina. I didn't have um, photos of the students. I'll get them. Um, this is a group in Cape Town, and, and the whole point here is to say that um, we run monthly meetings that deals with progression of radiation and scientific pulsars. And we get speakers to lecture to students, and we ask the students to know what kind of material or what kind of problems in fossil science they would like to learn about. So if this is something you're keen on, it's not just a South African group, it's South African, Indian, and Chinese. So I'm going to show you the South African participation. And we're also learning a lot from our own and Chinese colleagues, so it's quite a nice big group. If you want to join these monthly meetings, uh, please get in touch with me. That's why our email address there, or just um, tell me now. Um, and I'll let you know to do the next meeting. And our next meeting, I'm just going to actually give us a talk, so if you want to hear until please come. Um, it's every second she's done the month. And then, um, lastly, there was also um, a call I sent out to at least one of the SAA, Summer, May, lists last week. 
I'm going to double check the response to all the mailing lists uh, this week. And basically, it's just a call to ask students and researchers that are interested in the science to please join our African Muslim Science Group. So you can imagine that a cross is a group that has large international collaboration. They, they, uh, we're we're just kind of trying to unify uh, the African group within that, and the ideas we need to go to workshops like this um, and to get students involved in So if that email is in your inbox and you need to sign up, please go for it. Again, if it's not in your inbox, you can just come chat to me um, and I will get you started. Okay, so I'll end there. Thank you. 